Our first unison reading of scripture reading is from Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Let us begin. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And now for our time for the children. So I'm not seeing any little kitty doos with us this morning, but I do want to say um, just a couple things about that last passage. It was going to be a little different for the kids, but um, how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Um, It says, you know, if if they still refuse to hear, treat them like a Gentile and and a tax collector. Jesus treated them with grace. And then the other thing is we always pull out that line where for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We always do that when not a lot of people show up for something. Right, but it's in the context of conflict. It's you know, remember that God is with you when you're having those difficult conversations. Remember, honor that God is with you when you breathe deeply and 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 speak about the things that are difficult to talk about. That's what I was going to talk about with the kids, but good for adults to hear too. Our second scripture lesson is Psalm 103, which is one of my favorite psalms, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways, his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And would you say that with me? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts 
might be acceptable to you. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've been going through the Lord's Prayer, and today we are at, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses, or our sins, or how we miss the mark. This word for sin emphasizes that it's something that we do, self-empowered, our choice, our decision to do something or not do something. You know, the debt might be an apology that is owed or the thing that we should have done in the first place. As we forgive our debtors, the one who has yet to make amends that is owed to us, somebody who has wronged us, who has some moral or ethical or legal responsibility to come to us and make amends, who may choose not to. Forgiveness, it's the keys of the kingdom. I always, I did did a sermon on forgiveness once and I I really think forgiveness are the keys of the kingdom and I'm like, everybody bring out your keys and jangle them. I'm I'm not gonna ask you to do that. I think a lot of us have fobs now. They don't make the same sound. Right? But forgiveness is the keys to the kingdom. There was a brilliant movie uh, a few, several years ago, Manchester by the Sea. I highly recommend it. I'm going to use the word brilliant two more times. Brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, it will make you cry. It's about a man who cannot forgive himself. And you totally get it. You absolutely understand why. But you're pulling for him. Oh, my gosh, your heart is just willing him to move on with his life. But he doesn't. He doesn't think he can. He, he's stuck in this awful pattern of self-destruction. And it doesn't just affect him. It affects the people around him and the people who love him. If you have it in your mind that there are some things that just cannot be forgiven, then you will make your bed in Sheol. And that's, that's a line from Psalm 139 that has always struck me. If I make my bed in Sheol, God is there. It's the idea of making your bed. Sheol is the pit. It's, a, it's darkness. It's a living hell. It's even on your tippy toes, all, you can't see God. And sometimes we make our bed there. We choose to stay. When my sister lost a baby in utero, I, I wrote her a, a letter afterwards because, you know, with all the busyness and the things that you want to say. And, and I prayed about it, and, and she told me, oh, I turned this off because I thought, oh, finally a day where it's not. And now I'm like, eh, it's a little, little warm. I prayed about it, and she told me that it was helpful. So I'm, gr- thank you, God. But I said to her, what you're experiencing is a living hell. There's no other, you know, the... The, you know, the people can say things to try to look on the, you know, make it easier or make it. No, this is you, where you are right now. It's, it's a living hell and understandably. But I also know that you're a person of faith who knows that you don't have to stay there, that you're just passing through. And when you're ready you know, to get up and, and move forward with the people who, who are with you, who love you, it's okay. And I can come sit with you or I, and, and we'll choose to walk with you. And I, and I share, you know, again, I share that with you because, because that's part of life. In terms of forgiveness, if we won't forgive ourselves and we just choose to, you know, self-flagellation, just continually beat up ourselves for the rest of our lives, then we choose the pit. And you can be darn sure that we're going to cast other people into that pit if we think that there are things that cannot be forgiven and you're going to refuse to forgive them. I was talking with a woman once who was incredibly bitter about an ex-husband. 
And I said, I think you need to forgive him. And I can still hear her say, oh, but you don't know what he did. And I, and, and this time I didn't have the words at the time. I wish I did, but I didn't. And I, I, if I had that chance again, I would say, and look what he's still doing in your life. You're letting him control the rest of your life. And this woman oozed bitterness from her pores, and it touched every corner of her life, every relationship. She had been wronged, and she was going to let you know it, and she loved to tell the story. In Jesus, if we use the keys to the kingdom, our lives don't have to be one-story stories, one story that defines the rest of our life. I wrote a short play about this, about forgiveness, based on a book by Lewis Smedes that I highly recommend. It's called The Art of Forgiveness by Lewis Smedes. And he uses this analogy, and so I'll, I'll tell the story. This woman goes, goes to bed, and she wakes up in a jail cell. And she panics, and, you know, how did she get in? And she tries the bars, and she can't get out. And she falls down on her knees and says, Lord, help. And the whole time there's been somebody sitting off to the side who then says, hey, what's going on? And she explains that she woke up in this jail cell and she doesn't know how to get out. And he said, oh, you can get out. What do you mean? I don't have the key. Yeah, you have the key. Here's a guess. You've been really angry at somebody, and you're having trouble forgiving them. And she stammers, yeah. How do you know? Because that's what those bars are. It's your anger and your bitterness that's consuming you. Well, how do I get out? You have to forgive him. To which her response is, Heck no. And he said, that's the only way out. And she tries and, you know, looks for alternatives. And there's a little window in her cell, and there's this great big mansion in the distance. She goes, what's that? And she goes, oh, somebody else who refuses to forgive. And she goes, oh, it looks nice. How do I get that? And he's like, well, the longer you stay here, you know, you'll start to furnish it. Right? And, and it will expand. But just so you know, nobody visits her. She's in that big mansion all by herself. She has children, but they don't come to see her. They call her toxic. And then woman says, how, how do I forgive? And the angel says, you choose to. You choose to set yourself free. But what if they haven't apologized? You may never get that apology. You, you realize what you're doing, right? You're locking yourself in, a, a, in a, a jail cell of anger and resentment, and then you give the person who hurt you the keys to let you out, waiting for that apology. You could wait the rest of your life. You're going to give them that control over the rest of your life, or are you going to take your life back? And say, that happened to you, it was awful, but you are not going to let that control the rest of your life. Let it go. Forgive them, whether you never hear the words, I'm sorry, or not. Lewis Smedes would say, you forgive, you choose to forgive. Act like you've forgiven the person. And eventually you'll realize you did. In AA, they say, fake it till you make it. And it's true. Act like you've forgiven them. And for, and, uh, for, for the young people who are here, at one point, you'll get ma- mad at your parents for all the ways that they failed you growing up. Everybody in this room has done that. And then at some point, hopefully, you will forgive them for being human. But every once in a while, they'll do something that pushes that button and you're a kid again and you're angry. And that's when you remind yourself, I've forgiven them, they're human, and you let it go. And that's part of life. 
take the keys back. I have preached on forgiveness many times and does not mean that I am immune to get locking myself in that jail cell. I had a doozy and I just couldn't let it go. And when I finally did, oh my gosh, I felt like my soul could skip again, that I could dance again, that I just walked lighter. And I, and I confided in a friend and she said, you just seem so much lighter. And I was like, thank you. You can see it in a person. Keys to the kingdom. And again, the temptation is to crawl back. But just remind yourself, nope, I've forgiven. So there's forgiving ourselves. There's also remembering that God forgives us, and that's, that's the root of it. Jesus, from the cross, forgives us. Humanity threw our worst at Jesus. And we are so grateful from the words. Hanging from the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God can forgive anything. Sin does not have the last word. Love and grace and mercy have the last word. God wants to be in relationship with you, with us. And that relationship will mean repentance, and it will mean confession, and it will mean trying to live as God would have us live, but we will miss the mark again and again. And Jesus will forgive again and again, and will confess and repent and try again, again and again. So there's being forgiven, there's forgiving ourselves, and there's forgiving others with God's help. And if we can't, or if we choose not to, it's not that we can't, if we choose not to, then war, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that's what will reign in our midst. I'm always praying that God might reign in our midst. That is what will reign in our midst. And Jesus offers us this other way, this way of forgiveness. So again, there's being forgiven, forgiving ourselves, forgiving others, and sometimes forgiving God. And that's outside of the context of this prayer, except if we look back to the beginning of the prayer, it says, we say, hallow your name, make your name holy. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Live so that devotion is easy. Make your kingdom come. And we love the image of from Revelation of the new heaven and the new earth where there will be no more sighing, no more crying, and no more dying. We want that here, now. Please, hallow your name. But bad stuff does happen to good people. And sometimes we understand people make bad choices. But even then, I a friend of mine, her son made an awful choice that cost him his life. And she is angry at God. And I don't worry about God. God can take it. But it's just that prison cell of unforgiveness. And when the only person to cry out to is God and you refuse because you're so angry at God. Oh. We get it, though. You know, there's that, you know, you could have done something, Lord. We've all thought it. This is where the psalms are a help. And maybe I should have gone with a lament psalm versus Psalm 103, but lament psalms lay out the complaint against God, but then end with a word of faith, a reminder to self that you have been faithful to me in the past, and I'm going to move forward trusting that somehow, somehow, I'm going to land on my feet again in all of this. And again, that being said, years ago, I, a retiring pastor, when I was a new pastor, said to me, Robin, I, I preached about grief a lot. I always you know, I remind people, there will be joy down the road. He goes, but I don't want the new joy. His, his wife had died from cancer. And he goes, I don't want the new joy. I want the old joy. I'm not ready to accept that. I know it's coming. 
but right now I just want what I want. That's why the end of the book of Job is so dissatisfying, right? He, Job loses everything, and then at the end, everything is restored. But you're like, not everything is restored. He lost his family. He lost, you know, that's, you know, okay, he had new children, but the, he loved those. You know, ah! But I know that for everyone who is going through something awful, that God is trying to bless them, bless you each and every day to show you that God loves you. God is trying to bless you, to show you that God is with you. Jesus' last words in the book of Matthew, I will be with you always. That is our confidence and our hope. I pray that God gives my friend what she needs to meet the challenges of the day. And that's also part of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. I pray the same for you, for me, for all of us. We all walk bravely and briefly through this life. And faith tells us that we do not walk alone. I pray that we will not be a one-storied people, that we will be a many-storied people. Sad stories, but joyous stories too. Jesus died on the cross, that's one story, not the only story. There's Easter, and there's Pentecost, and there's a story that God has with each of us walking in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, learning to forgive, taking back the keys, embracing our freedom, and praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.